welcome to All in Yellow. The official Norwich City podcast. Better delivery! Today we have a real treat for Norwich City fans. Joining us all the way from his native Sierra Leone, it's former Canary, Kai Kamara. Kai Kamara, it is an absolute pleasure to have you join us on the All In Yellow podcast. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm, I, uh, actually, I should, have put on some, I should have put on yellow shirt coming into the podcast. <laughs> but uh, Let's just pretend I'm wearing yellow, okay? We can edit it in after. It's fine. It's fine. Am yeah. I right in thinking you're in Sierra Leone at the moment? How long have you been back there for? I am. I am back home in Sierra Leone and I've been here for about three weeks now. Um, doing a little bit of work with my foundation, Hardship Hands Foundation, just sensitizing kids, you know, school going kids with soccer and just, you know, uh, celebrating the holidays with them. How long have you been doing that for? Uh, we've hit or oh, the whole three weeks i've been here really we've hit about uh, fourth community coming up this weekend so um it's uh, it's good you know every each clinic that we've hosted has been about 60 kids 60 plus and i'll feel bad for all the other kids standing around um the playground and wanting to join because you know they're seeing all the other kids but what we did was we registered all these kids in school at the moment and uh, making sure that we're coming back during the holiday to kind of give back to them. It must be amazing for them because you're obviously a, a huge national hero over there in Sierra Leone, Kai, which you'll, you'll, you won't admit because you're a modest chap, but it must be really nice for them to see you and, and you know, working to get them active. Yeah, I, I, they, they, uh, I'm honoured myself, but they were, they were shocked because they didn't believe when they were getting registered for the camp because it's the first year our camp is running. And uh, so most, most of the kids didn't believe it until after our first camp that we did out in the provinces in Kenema, my hometown, and every single one of them, all the locations started getting really excited. And I didn't just go by myself. I bring, you know, some of the national team players with me um, to get involved in it. And uh, so it's good. And you're obviously playing in the MLS. You've been out in America for a while, but you were born in Sierra Leone, weren't you? Tell us about that. Yes, uh, born in Sierra Leone, moved to the to the U.S. when I was 16, and uh, it was all a blessing after then, you know, so, and just moved around a bit. Obviously, that's why when I uh, came over there, my number at word was, was 16, uh, because I felt like, you know, that was the, the, the year of opportunities that opened up for me, and because, you know, growing up in a Civil War country, obviously, that's what people knew about Sierra Leone back then, War of Blood Diamonds and all this stuff, you know, it was always... Uh, tough, but I felt like the blessings really opened up when I was 16 and moved to the States and went to school. I didn't go to uh, America to play soccer or football. Um, but finally being around there and going to school and realizing how much I can go from high school to college playing soccer. And it's late really when we do come out in America to play because I was 23 when I finally became a professional. So, you know, it's a uh, Tough times, but again, like I said, it's it's been a blessing. I come from a little 150,000 people town of Kenema in Sierra Leone and moving to America, growing up in Los Angeles, you know, it's just ridiculous. But I've traveled the world, man, and this is not just because you guys have, are, are on the, uh, the podcast right now, but and even making that stop at Norwich, you know, I tell people that it's one of the best places I've been and because maybe – because I'm from a small town, so I love that small town vibe, you know? Yeah, Kai, obviously, we just want to start, if we may, just a little bit of a chat about your very early life in Sierra Leone, because it's obviously had its troubles uh, over the years, and there was a, a civil war, early 90s, and, and did that, how was that for your family? Is that why you had to move away? Yeah, definitely, that's, that's the reason why we moved away. Uh, my mom actually left uh, left Sierra Leone when I was six years old and she moved uh, through this lottery program where people can, you know, win the lottery to move to America. And so she left. And right when she left in uh, 1990, the war broke out. So I was stuck in Sierra Leone and not able to get out. And obviously for her too, she didn't have a full papers. She only, you know, carried just a little bit of a visa stay in America for many years. And, uh, uh, yes, we went through the war, went through, you know, seen a lot of stuff that kids should never see. That's why when everything's happening around the world, you know, feel bad for the kids that's in it because, you know, the kids are the ones innocent where, you know, should never experience some of the things that's happening. 
Um, but again, like you said, it's, it's, it's more of a blessing to be able to walk away from that and uh, move to the Gambia. And for two years where we were refugees and looking to seek asylum here in America, uh, I'm not in America, I'm back in Sierra Leone. <laughs> I'm looking to seek asylum in, 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 in Sierra Leone. So what, what happened was um, if you have family members in the, in the States, they were able to apply for you as refugees. So I moved to the U.S. as a refugee. And uh, five years, six years later, I was a citizen and soccer dream just, you know, just went all over the place. That must have been so hard not being able to live with your mum for all of that time. Then. How did you find that? Yeah, it was, it was definitely a different, different experience because now we're doing this, you know, during this COVID season, we're able to do all this right now um, using Zoom and, you know, calling FaceTimes. But those things didn't exist then. I remember having to go over to a neighbor's house every once in a while because my mom would call on the, you know, the phones that, you know, you put your finger in and spin it around. And uh, they're like, oh, your mom just called. Okay, come back and sit, sit there for a few minutes and wait for the next phone call to come in. Um, just she was really good at communicating. She called every week, every, you know, days. And we spoke to her all the time. Never, I didn't see her in about, what was it, 20 years? But um, communication was always there. You didn't see her in 20 years, did you say? Yes, yes, yes. I finally saw my mom um, when I came to the States. So when I, I first saw her, I mean, we see pictures. So it's, it's weird because when you see those things, you feel like you're seeing each other all the time. But um, when she had left and finally um, when I, you know, I saw her, um, it was good. It was good, really. But, uh, you know, that's part of the Civil War that happened. And you know, it's the past now for the country of Sierra Leone, really, because the country is really growing and me being here and bringing my own three kids and taking them to Kenema where I grew up and just showing them, you know, with places I went to school, places I played soccer and those things. It's it's been it's been a blessing. That's amazing. I mean, that's an incredible thing for someone to have to suffer. I, I know we've all we've all missed our parents and we, you know, during this covid period, never mind a 20 year gap. Let's hope it doesn't turn into that, obviously. Um, but yeah, Kai. When you went then to the States, you got an incredible opportunity uh, for education as well as, as, well as soccer. Um, perhaps you could explain to people who might not be familiar with the American college sports system and how that is such a good opportunity to learn your, your soccer as, whilst getting an education. Cal State Dominguez Hills, uh, that's a Division II school. Really, it's like having, you know, the Prem and the championship. So that's really what the school systems is like. So Cal State was a Division II school. Um, I, I went there. It wasn't far away from the house, you know, where I lived with my mom. And I saw the building, the stadium was being built. Los Angeles Galaxy was building their stadium in that campus. So that's how I chose to go to that school, even though, Later on, they were like, well, it's a Division II school. You're not going to be picked from there to go professionally because it's really hard. You have to be playing at a Division I school. And I was like, okay. So I played there for a season, and I tried to move to a Division I school. But there was just this thing about that school, this family environment that I'm, I'm used to. You know, again, growing up in Kenema and all that has, you know, really taught me about family. So I felt that from Cal State Dominguez Hills and the coaching staff that was there. And I pushed myself to say, well, yes, it doesn't happen for people to move from Division Two, but, you know, I want to be one of those first people to, to do it. So, you know, one of the, the great legends of coaches in America named uh, Ziggy Schmidt, who, you know, passed away, um, I think it's two years now, Ziggy passed away. And, uh, you know, he used to, he's from California area. He coached the Galaxy. So every once in a while, they will call me up uh, to go train with the Galaxy. And to be closer and closer, um, guys, you wouldn't believe, but I even worked at the stadium because I wanted to be closer to the Galaxy. So I worked operations crew, which you set up the fields, you break it, break down the fields for game days. And I just wanted to be there every day. So every once in a while, I see the coach. It's like a movie. It's like, hey, you want to come in and, and, and come train tomorrow? And I'll say, yeah. <laughs> and I'll speak to my manager. And he's like, yeah, it's fine. You're on the clock, but you can still go train. It sounds like the movie Rudy, if you've ever seen that. <laughs> it's literally knocking on the door of the stadium. Yeah. No, no it's, it's, it's great. Like, I didn't speak to, you know, one of the greatest, Kobe Jones. And he calls me big man. And I remember just walking around the stadium all the time when I'm working. And I, every time I see him growing up in L.A. And Kobe being one of the, you know, the most famous after, after, after Kobe Bryant. You know, he, he's the soccer, Kobe Jones. 
as black kids and follow his story. So I knew him for so many years. And then till this day is when he still calls me the same way he used to call me when I walked around the stadium and just, hey, what's up, big man? What's up, big man? I don't even think he knows my name is Kai. Oh. <laughs> I <laughs> love that. But Kai, given everything you had endured and, and seen in Sierra Leone during your childhood, that's a huge contrast to then end up in America and, and be in among it. How did that feel? Oh, my God. Again, it's there was this thing about, I know I was really happy, just joy. One, to really just move, I knew, knowing that I'm going to live with my mom again, you know, um, because the build up from all the years. And then as a kid, you know, being that young, you're just so excited because most of the other kids that we were with, moving from Sierra Leone from the war, moving to the Gambia and lived there for a year and a half to two, um, waiting for, you know, our refugee programs to go ahead. Um, you see the other kids were able to travel, their their applications got, you know, approved before yours. So you always looked forward to when it's going to happen. So when it did, you know, there was just a joy. You know, I didn't really think so much about the the before like growing up in the war and all that stuff more when I finally started playing soccer and you know yes I, I had the nightmares of, of the war and all that but when I finally started playing playing in college then when the stories you know people were asking for your background and all that that's when I started to realize that okay it, it wasn't just you know all smooth but that's what made me who I am you know I'm just one big happy bubbly kid and I'm just enjoying every minute of this journey that I've you know I've been part of it's incredible positivity and we're feeling it all the way over here in uh, rainy England in in lockdown uh yeah <laughs> so, so you just suddenly got this realization that actually all these kids around me they've had a much smoother start than I have um, but you said that that's when you started playing soccer. I didn't realize that was when you got into it. You didn't play it at home in Sierra Leone. It was when you got to the States. No, yeah, I didn't play. I didn't play. I I, I, I want to say I played my first competitive because I, I played one season in high school. And that was about, you know, 17, 18 years old because I moved to the States at 16. And it was too late that season to play. So the next season I jumped into high school soccer. And that's the first time I started playing. So um, I did yeah, two seasons in high school and two seasons in college. Um, yeah, I played really late, and but it's good. It's good, really. You know, for the kids, for younger people playing um, in academies and having an opportunity to do that, sometimes it does drain you because you've been in an academy system for so many years. You know, the U.S. system is different. Obviously, before it was different, we all had to go through the college system. We're coming out to be professionals about. Uh, between the age of 21 to 23, that's when you do come out when in Europe, um, everybody else has been established by those times. But then again, you know, some players have been playing since they were eight in an academy could be all drained by that time. So I, I came into the scene really late. That's why I even going to Norwich and all that at the age that I did. Um, I mean, that was really late to for somebody to make a jump like that. But to me, I just looked at it as, you know, it was a, it was the beginning. Like, I wish I was there right now, you know, for how much I know now and, you know, my performances that's been in the past few years. When I was there, I was feeding off this Premier League hype um, of just being there. Am I right in thinking Columbus Crew was the first team to select you? Did you know much about that and how that was going to happen? Yeah, just, um, again, Ziggy Schmidt, who was coaching Los Angeles Galaxy when I used to train with them. Later on, went to Columbus Crew and became the coach, the coach at Columbus Crew. So that was my, uh, you know, my guess that I was going to join Ziggy um, in Columbus. And obviously, when the draft happened, Ziggy uh, decided to um, to pick me, and then I went to Columbus. And and how was that as a first uh, taste of professional sport? Did you did you take to it easily? Did it feel like a big step up from a D two school? A huge step, a huge step, because being in college. Um, what happened in college, we play a three-month season, you know, in a three-month season in college. Now, here we're coming for preseason, and preseason um, pre was uh, basically two months. So you play your whole college season in preseason. So which was, you know, as being a, a young professional, which, you know, is still tough because the college seasons in America are really not that long you know, I'm um, in the fall season. So kids, uh, kids or young, young players are playing in college um, and then there's multiple substitutions and all this. So you're not really as fit, you know, for a professional level. 
and you come into preseason, which is the hardest one, and then before the season starts, now you're playing a 10-month season. So as a player and as a young player, you get all, like, you know, weared out before even the season is halfway through. And then came Sporting Kansas City, where you really, really began to, to make your name. How did that move come about? The Sporting Kansas City, actually, is a, it was a place I turned down. I said, uh, no way, I'm not going there. <laughs> because Kansas is a, it's a city where everyone that visits Kansas says, I'm not going back. Like, what's there? There's nothing there. So when I got a phone call from the head coach, Peter Vermes, who is also the sporting director and, and general manager, saying you know we've picked you we want you to come to to um to sport in and i said i'm sorry i said i need you to call los angeles call somebody there and just send me home i am not coming to kansas it's not happening and he's like kai, please sleep. <laughs> yeah he's like kai we were on the phone for like i don't know how long i said i'm not coming he said uh please just give me a chance i said it's not happening i don't like that place i'm not coming there and then he insisted, like, I come in the next day so we can sit down and have a one-on-one -on -one talk. So I did. I said, it's your money. So you spend your money, fine. You fly me in, I'm not staying. <laughs> but uh, let's say I got there and, again, family. I just felt it when I was there. And, yeah, I don't know how many years it is later. My wife's from Kansas. Now we got three kids. I got houses in Kansas. So, yeah. <laughs> Wow, that's quite a turnaround, Kai, from not wanting to go there at all. <laughs> that's amazing. So you felt a real connection. Was it was it the fans? Was it the people you were playing with? What was what was No, the no, because I didn't get to it yet. We didn't get to that. It was just me and Peter Vermes, the head coach. And you know, really that's where it started. He told me about the vision, which exactly how it is running there now, obviously without more championships, but how he wanted Kansas City to be the hub of soccer in America. You know, we played in a baseball stadium that held maybe, I don't know, five or 6,000 people a game that we still don't, you know, pack it out. So then having the stadium that they built um, and then we were selling out, you know, for how many years when I played there up to now. And then now building the U.S. training center in Kansas. So it was all the vision that we, I sat with him that day and he told me that I was just itching like this is going to be great. And when was it that you kind of knew that England were interested in you as well? Because obviously you had this project at Sporting Kansas City and you knew what you wanted to achieve there. But was the dream always to play in the Premier League or even the Championship? But how did you know you wanted to move to England? No, no, I actually wanted to play in France. I wanted to play in uh, Ligue 1 because, you know, watching highlights all the time, you see all the Africans playing over there. So I just wanted to be part of that league and play there. But being in America, I was, I was content, you know, I was content. Um, it's when I started playing for the national team, really, um, in, in around 2010, where people in Sierra Leone, they don't get to see MLS as much. You know, MLS was growing, having David Beckham later on, and people hearing so much about the MLS. But coming back home to Sierra Leone, and people were like, oh, we're not able to watch games there. We want to see you in the Premier League. We want to see you in the Premier League. And I'm like, uh, it's not just a phone call to just call someone in the Premier League and move, you know. <laughs> But um, so when the opportunity came about, I was at preseason, actually, when my agent, you know, called me one time. It was never a build up. There was never me and my agent discussing, like, you know what, let's look over and see, you know, if I can play in England. He just called me one morning. We're in preseason. And he says, hey, uh, there's a couple of teams interested to take your own loan. And I was like, where? He said, England. I said, let's go. And then he Love called it. me. I know. It said who the team was I was online right away just doing my research and that was it it was just like I said it's been a movie and I, I'm enjoying it and how excited were your family because I know I think I remember reading that cinemas were full when you came <laughs> and played in Norwich everyone just wanted to watch you play I, but that must have made you feel so proud I wish I can uh, I can show maybe one of these days you guys should call in the daytime where I can walk you guys out just outside of my house there's a cinema that's built and very local, like just uh, wood and, and, uh, and the roof that we use, you know, the zincs that we use, that's how everything is built out here. And those places just, they fill up, you know. And now that they heard, you know, one of their own was playing in England because this is the league that they can watch, you know, most of the games back then. Now they get the, Premier, the, the La Liga and other countries, even MLS. But the Premier League was the only leagues they can get here more often. 
So those places were always full. And till this day, people are always like, I remember watching your game against Everton. Da, 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 da. I was like, that's so long ago. <laughs> Amazing. And you're the first player from Sierra Leone to score a Premier League goal. Yeah, but I won't be the last. I will not be the last. Because, uh, and that's what we're doing again. Myself, just try to be an ambassador for some of these young guys. And, you know, and hopefully opportunities will open up for most of them. You know, we have guys playing mostly in Scandinavia. But, you know, hopefully there will be more guys that can jump up, you know, over there and, uh, and, and score some goals. So, you know, my, rec my name in the record books can be moved. I also have to give credit to Natanya Chalaba. I know he's English, they say he's English, but he's one of ours. He's from, you know, he's Sierra Leone, Sierra Leone too. So, and he's been doing his stuff in England for a long time. It sounds like you've got an incredible sense of pride and almost responsibility to the people of Sierra Leone. You've, you've been afforded some great opportunity and you want as many people to experience that as possible. Yeah, 100%, 100%, uh, because... I wouldn't have been, I don't know, you know, if I would have been as strong mentally or been as happy as I am now if I didn't grow up in the craziness that I grew up in, you know, as a kid. Because with all that, it's what's given me this now. I mean, my wife is from Kansas City and, you know, my kids, uh, like I said, three kids, but I'm so happy to bring them back here to Sierra Leone and just we're here for, you know, over a month, we're going to be here and they're comfortable living in Africa and, and just, and I'm comfortable too. And I feel good. I feel safe with them and with the food and it just, just everything. So it's a place that, you know, that I really love and I wish I can do more and more for, you know, but at the same time, because again, it's a place that's given me so more. So being in England and, and making, you know, the country proud uh, is something good, but I don't want to just be the only person to do it. Do you get recognized wherever you go in Sierra Leone? <laughs> and is it annoying? Uh, 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 yeah, because I'm tall, you know? I'm, I'm not <laughs> short. I'm sure it's not just that. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm pretty tall, so people are, you know, it's amazing. That actually, the, the weird one is now in, wait, we're not in 2020 anymore, but just the COVID times, because I come home. And for the first couple of weeks, really, I was with my mask because I wear a mask and the glasses and a hat all the time. And then when somebody would go, Kai Kamar, and I'm like, how do you know that's me? I have a mask and glasses and a hat, you know, but I guess your frame or when people kind of know, you know, kind of, you know, who you are, you know, but I'm not, you know, I don't have security. I don't, you know, I, I love being around the people because I can say again, working at Galaxy Stadium, being a fan of the Galaxy, when people are a fan of, you know, me or the national team, you know, I'm out there. I'm in the streets. I talk to you and I want you to feel like we're just, you know, normal people. <laughs> so what did that goal that you scored against Everton, what did that mean to you to score in the Premier League? And what would that have meant to the people of Sierra, Sierra Leone? Because, I mean, that was a bullet header, if I remember rightly. Yeah, and it was it was uh, it was against one of the guys I actually just played with. So I was like, "Yes, Tim Howard." <laughs> I'm sorry, um, <laughs> but uh, no, I was I don't know I don't know. It was a blur. Um, the story of me even getting on the on the field again, Norwich. I felt the family in Norwich. You know, Chris Hutton was such a great guy. The way he explained stuff when I got there, the way they welcomed me on the team. You know, Russ Martin, where I speak to, just had a birthday, I think, yesterday. Um, mm -hmm. So the, all those guys, you know, Grant Hall. And I wasn't going to play. I was not there right away, ready. I was in preseason. So for the first day against Fulham, actually, when, you know, Holtley was feeling a bit injured and I was sitting in the back of the room just having my lunch when they come to me and say, hey, Kai, do you have your boots? We need you to strap up. I was like, wait, what? Like, is this, like you said, Rudy, right? Is this a movie? You mean that? And he's a shot. I was like, I don't have my boots. He's like, okay, we can send somebody to call me to get it. I was like, what's going on? But, you know, to come on against Fulham first, I was just, I don't know, shocked. Like, wow, I'm fine. I'm really here. So against Everton, I, I had a feeling. One, just because it was Tim Howard. I was playing against, you know, another American. And I said, if something was to happen, it needs to happen now. And that corner kick, you know, uh, Snotty being on it. And I looked, who was marking me? I, there was just something that felt right. You know, I was like, okay, this is one of the biggest guys in the Premier League marking me. And I am the most dominant 
area guy in MLS. So now it's time to show it. And just a perfect ball and just went in the back of the net. But um, um, I was, I don't know, I was, me and Basong, just, <laughs> I don't know how many celebrations I did. I, I was dancing, I was doing this, I was doing that. <laughs> Those were yeah. iconic celebrations with you and Sebastian Basson. Like they will live in, in Norwich memories forever. It was brilliant to see. But I just want to know when you you obviously joined in what January. About, what about so the, the celebration of me and Russ? You know, that was good. My Irish did that was well. was good. I didn't score the goal. <laughs> no, but didn't you say you were trying to take it, but wasn't it St. Patrick's Day or something? It was, it was, because I had I had done another <laughs> Irish jig back in uh, in America, so I showed it to him. You know, and being Irish, I was like, hey, I've done this celebration before. So if I ever score a goal, you score a goal. We're both on the field. We have to do it. So it was perfect for a guy that's seriously one of the best players I've ever played with, by the way. And in and, and, and Wes, uh, he was, anyway, to, he's so quiet for me to get him to do that. I was like, yes, you know, <laughs> I've, scored a, I've scored another goal. <laughs> So can I just ask, Kai, you came in January. So you came in the middle of the season. Was that difficult for you? Obviously, you said that the players were really welcoming and, and you gelled in right away. And obviously, this massive persona, this character that everyone loved, fans and players alike. But did you feel there was extra pressure to kind of hit the ground running coming in the middle of the season? I, I, it should be. There should be a lot of pressure, you know, for anybody coming in. But again, this, these are the lessons that I've learned along my, you know, my professional career being there i was more excited being in the premier league you know i was in as experienced being in the premier league and i wished i really would have went back even after my loan finish um trying to go back to england finally when i went to to middlesbrough i wish i would have went back to norwich uh, because finally i was settling in and figuring out what it's really like to play in england with the pressure of the fans and you know the relegation and promotions and all that stuff i didn't know what it you know it was like I didn't know what it meant so I was just on the hype I was just this one bubbly happy you know I call myself a kid even though I was 20 years, years old but I was that's just what I was you know I was I wish I could learn you know faster but you know again I, I enjoyed my time but anyone going into season so after that that's why when I came back to America I was a different player because I learned so much from being in England that the pressure that this that what it really means to be a professional you know and you know it changed it changed everything i wanted to really go back but things were going really well in, in america so i just stayed i can actually vouch for you being quite a big bubbly character kai because i don't know if you'll even remember this there was one time that you came and did a community appearance because i was working at the club and we bundled you in a car it was me, and I don't know if you remember Chloe and Steve, who worked at the football club. Chloe, yeah. And we, we threw you in a car, and we took you out to Cromer on the seaside. Uh -huh. And uh, we, yeah, it's a lovely place. And you, uh, you were just so excited to be there. I remember we took you down to the pier, and you stood on the pier as in that Titanic, I'm the king of the world, <laughs> the edge. And, and, and then we took you to some of the kids' sessions. Uh, and, and you were just, I'll tell you what, you were just a joy to spend an evening with. And it's just positivity oh, that you. everyone needs. Thank you. Because I, I, I can feel it. That's why I say, you know, I, I tell my wife, I go, man, I wish I would have stayed in England just a little bit longer because I was really just there and just imagining like I was just in my room watching the Premier League. Like, what am I doing here? How am I here? Everybody in Sierra Leone watching this and it's calling me. I'm like, this is this. This can be real. So that's still the moment I was living. So it wasn't, you know, it didn't. It was too quick, you know, January, February, March, April, May, and I was gone, you know? So it was too quick in those months to then figure it all out. I, again, goals, I wanted to score more goals. I wish I scored more goals. Maybe that would have, you know, kept me in the club. But again, there was so much to it, you know, not, not being uh, uh, secured, not being safe, you know, for not getting relegated. And I remember the last game was against, uh, was against Man City. And again, that was one of the biggest teams in the league. And you don't expect much to play away at the end and have something. But what was the result of that game? And, the, you know, spanking Man City. And I'm sitting in America. I go, man, like, you know. So, but again, for anyone, you know, I mean, some guys grew up differently. I didn't grow up in a soccer academy. I didn't grow up playing very competitive. I boomed late. And from 23 to playing in England five years later or so, or, or sorry, 
from from 2006 and then going to England and playing in England in, in, in 2013, that was too quick for me to be there. And I didn't really, you know, settle in, in as a professional. I was just on a, on a, on a hype. And given how much you enjoyed your, your fairly short spell at Norwich, were you sad then that it wasn't made permanent? But, uh, no, I wasn't. I wasn't. I remember going into uh, Chris Hutton's place because obviously my agent was the one dealing with everything, you know, coming back to me because I think my transfer fee was about, uh, I think, five mil is what the MLS was asking. And I was 28 years old. And they were like, well, we bought Clint Dempsey for, you know, lower and he was younger. And the next minute, uh, who did we sign then? The striker from Portugal, Norwich signed, right? Uh, Ricky Van Wolfswinkel. Ricky Van Wolfswinkel. And then, but then I went to, I went to Chris's office and I just shook his hand. I was like, thank you. He's like, Kai, I'm sorry. I was like, no, no, don't be. I was like, it's good. Thank you for this experience. Like, it was like a kid going through something. I was just happy to be there and say, thank you very much. And give him a hug. And I was just like, okay, on that flight, going back to the U.S. So I never really... So that's why going back, I really wanted to go back to, 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 to England, but I wanted to go there, but they had already picked a striker. And uh, so, yeah, the stories just changed after that. But where did your time with Norwich rank among your career highlights? Top, top. Obviously, it's the, the only team I played, I played on, on, in the Premier League, uh, scoring a goal. But, you know, not just that. I mean, you could have had any other dreams to go play um, for, you know, Chelsea to say and they send you out on loan but it wasn't that you know I showed up at Norwich you know and <laughs> the people to I don't know maybe this is a name that will ring bell you know like Nate Nathan Reeves you know somebody like that that's just on the outside of soccer and, and Norwich but will make life so comfortable for players like whether it was getting me on the boat to just go around you know the canal for a little bit with me and my wife or you know just people around the street, the neighbors, that it felt right. It was really the best place to go and play for anyone, you know, just getting over there. And, you know, the, there's pressure for sure. I can't say there's no pressure, but it just felt right. And I just really wish I can get a second chance. But anyway, that was, I wish I could have had a second chance, I should say. But it just felt right. And Norwich is top. After, you know, Kansas City that I played for for many years, Norwich definitely has to be top. And did you have did you have children when you were in Norwich as well? Or was it just you and your wife? Just me, just me and... Uh, uh, were we married then? Or were you just my fiancé? Engaged. Yeah, just my uh, fiancé. Did she like Norwich? Oh, she loved it. <laughs> she loved Norwich. She only came to visit while I was there. Oh, the, the best story too was... I lived in the apartment where Harry Kane used to live. Mm. Awesome. Yeah. I know. I, I remember you actually coming scored in. more goals for Norwich than he did. Very true. Very <laughs> true. <laughs> I know. I remember coming in. Everybody would tell me where I was living. You know, Harry Kane, I was like, I have no clue who that is. You know, and then later when I left, then I saw where he was playing. I was like, oh, yeah. I live in the same apartment as Harry Kane, guys. <laughs> no, no, where did you live? Because I remember hearing that, did you occasionally used to walk to the ground? Did you live really near Carroll Road? I did, yeah. I walked, I walked, <laughs> I walked to the stadium because I was just right there. I walked to the stadium. The best experience ever was walking to the stadium. Like I say, it's a movie. I would walk to the stadium for games. I would walk back to my apartment with the fans after a game. And just chatting with them while we're walking. Like that must have been so I, nice for fans as well, because players players these days are so untouchable. So to have someone like you who is just embracing everything about the club is just so refreshing. And that's why I say it's that's why you feel so so I felt so well in Norwich and because it's such this family, you know, thing. Yes, there has to be pressure. People need to demand more from people, but <laughs> me and my career in my life how I've felt connected with teams why I love Kansas City is also because how I connect with the people off the field because when you do that and you're open with them you're able to converse with them then I know you know you this is you know the doc is a doctor he's a you know a, a auto mechanic this person is this but at the end of the day they come to games you know with passion and they support this team and they love this team and they talk about the history of this club and I learned those things from those people. 
So that's what the connection was. And that's how I felt it in Norwich, you know, when I was there. That's incredible, Kai. It's amazing to hear. I, I'm so proud that you, you got to wear the Norwich shirt because nothing makes us prouder as Norwich City fans than people who pull on the shirt that we all wanted to wear as kids and play for Norwich. So if you get to wear that shirt, it, it's brilliant that you wear it with such pride. No, it's great. It's great. I, I played in America in, in, in 2008, you know, with Darren Huckabee. And I didn't even know the history, you know, with him in Norwich until I got there. And I was like, uh, this is just perfect. This is smooth. You know, I saw Darren around and I was like, okay, this is nice, you know. <laughs> I think the, uh, the people in the stands certainly embraced your warmth and your different character that you don't often get in football over here. And it made you hugely popular, even for that short spell of time. You must have felt that from them. Yeah, I got a song. I got a heart shaped hand song, you know. <laughs> that was, I, I, somebody sent it to me, seriously, not too long ago. Those are the things you sit there. I'm like, just a kid from Kenema, Sierra Leone. And I don't know, man, these things, it's like, it's, it's not, it wasn't meant to happen, but it happened. And I'm just, I'm just grateful for it. It's you so know. nice to hear you reflect on, on that time and those memories so fondly. It's, it's really, really good to hear. I need but, to come back. Oh. I need to come back, visit, go, go in the stadium, watch a game live, obviously when people can do that. Because that's one of the things that's, you know, on my list that I want to go back there. I want to, you know, even make a training set, you know, uh, appear at a training session. Just just now that I really feel like an adult, you know, than before. Because before I was just on this hype and I just wanted to go back. I want to go back there just so I can soak it and really look around me and say, wow, okay, this is what it was. Not just, you know, going around like this the whole time. And so, Yeah. <laughs> We'd love oh, you to would have be you. so welcome. You know that. Thank you. Thank you. So after Norwich, you did stay in England. Obviously, you went back to America, and then and then you had your spell at Middlesbrough. How did that unfold? Uh, it was again me now having that itch, you know, the itch of being in Norwich and being in the Premier League, and now I'm returning back to MLS and feeling like, no, I can play in this league. You know, I can play in the Premier League. I played games. I played what ten or eleven games while I was there, and I can see myself growing so when I came back I told my agent that yes please now shop me around let's find a team so multiple teams came up uh, maybe just two other teams in the prem didn't end up working out but about three to five other, other teams in championship and so we decided to go over you know to to, to Middlesbrough when they call us like yes because Middlesbrough also was a team that you know is a team that has so much history and so when they said the name, I was just like, uh, yes. And I remember being in the, we landed and uh, being in the car to head over to Middlesbrough. And I got another phone call from Roy Vallecano in Spain and saying, Roy Vallecano wants you. And they were selling, what they were selling to me was their next game was against Barcelona. They're like, are you really going to go to Middlesbrough and play championship? Or are you going to come here and this weekend we're going to play Barcelona? Had my agent sitting in the car and we're going. And now I'm like, all these thoughts are going through my head and thinking Sierra Leone and thinking all these things, like my friends and family, like what would they want to see? And we're driving, we're driving. And I said, just keep driving. I was like, we're already here. Just keep driving. There's no way to turn back around and get on that plane and go to Spain. So I'm happy again because I went there. It was an experience of a team that had been relegated that was going through a lot and, you know, Tony Morbury was the head coach when I was there. Two months later, was gone or so. And then, you know, more coaching changes. You know, my first injury in my whole career, first and only injury that I've had, happened there. And I learned so much. So it was great. Oh, that's interesting. But then, obviously, from Middlesbrough, you were looking to move to Wolves and something happened with the national team that meant you couldn't get a work permit. Talk us, talk us through how that happened. <laughs> Uh, you guys are making me write my whole book right here today. And, and <laughs> <laughs> That's what we're here for. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, uh, wolves, wolves. I so after after Middlesbrough, I actually I'd already committed to going back to America. I'd committed to joining uh, um, 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 Columbus Crew, and again when Columbus Crew called, my thought was, I played two seasons in Columbus and scored five goals. And now I was in England, Middlesbrough, and played Norwich, and I felt like I've learned so much. I was like, yes, please. So I'd already committed with them. 
but the only thing I was going to go back to, to when I tried to go to Wolves, um, was a deal that was only going to go until January. So it was really tough, you know? So I think I terminated in September, I want to say, and then I was looking to stay. So it was a tough one. And Sierra Leone had dropped in FIFA ranking. So I remember uh, my agent and Wolves were talking and saying, well, if they're going to work so hard to get me back my work permit, you know, I have to be committed for longer than just three months. And I just said, seriously, I said, I said it myself that don't worry about it. It will be fine. And I just, you know, booked the flight and just uh, returned back to the States. And on the topic of the Sierra Leone um, national team, obviously you've retired from national duty a couple of times, but recently you came back for the Africa Cup of Nations. It's a little bit confusing. C can you, you can explain it, can't you? Uh, I love this country, you know, again, I, I want more. I, I want more, more and more, and not for me, but for the people coming after us, you know, the kids and the younger players coming after us, you want to see better. And, you know, a perfect example is, uh, you know, Obama Young tweeting what, or posting what he did just recently. And <laughs> those are the things that I've been through since 2008 that I've, you know, 2008 that I've been on national team, you know, going through airports, delays, and all these, you know, crazy stuff or not preparing well for a game. You know, one of the best one I explain to people is I played on my national team since 2008, but I've never played in a friendly match because we've never had one. So how do you prepare to, you know, to represent the country so well that we love and the people are so passionate, but you don't really prepare yourself well. And I'm an outspoken guy, you know, and I don't, you know, I'm not quiet. So whenever I do that, you know, I get in, you know, some kind of turmoil with the people that runs, you know, the soccer and, when that happens, you know, I have to either think of myself, okay, I'm, I'm backing off, I'm stepping away, because if I don't do that, then they say we're suspending you. And this doesn't look good. You know, I don't like being suspended for something that I know is true and I can speak my mind out for it. So instead of that, I'll just, you know, I walk away, speak my truth, let people know. But again, I feel like, you know, when I do leave national team, I get so many phone calls from the players that's inside the national team and asking me to come back because when I'm around, you know, I do help put some things in place, you know, and so that makes me proud. It makes like I'm not just doing stuff in vain. So this is why my this is obviously my last return. And I hope I'm not, you know, announced another retirement until I'm actually done playing. Uh, but now we're working, you know, I'm working with them and working everybody else. You know, I really hope that, you know, if even I'm not going to, help in the administrative change, but really with the players around me to really try to make an impact. And so hopefully we can get one or two guys playing England. Yeah, is that the goal for your, your national team players? What are you guys working towards? What's the big picture for the national team? And, and the, the, uh, uh, it's, it's qualification, which is very difficult. You know, it's really, really difficult with the position that we're in. But at the same time, because the country, there's no league going on in the country, which affects so much. So the local players, the local players are not, really you know getting as much playing time that they're supposed to get um so all the other international players guys playing all around the, the country are really you know looking to you know make a name and make a mark for Sierra Leone and you know but that's the goal we want to get more players playing overseas and in top leagues how passionate are American football fans because obviously there's a lot of different sports in America are they as passionate you mean American soccer fans Yes. Yes. Sorry. Soccer, football, soccer. Soccer, I mean soccer. Right. There, there you go. <laughs> um, yeah, it's growing. It's really growing. Again, I remember, you know, working in stadiums and what it used to be like and the, the appearance of David Beckham, who I interviewed myself ahead of Mike and I interviewed him that day. <laughs> I know it was random. How did that um, go? Oh, I posted a picture a little while ago, actually, on my Instagram of me just interviewing David Beckham. Uh, but just David Beckham came in and MLS went boom. You know, everybody knew what MLS was. And then having Seattle Sounders, you know, Portland, uh, Timbers, you know, some of the, 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 the stadiums that started filling up for every game, you know, they really, you know, started making a mark. Obviously, Toronto FC was one of them, I can remember. They started making the mark of fans in America, you know, Kansas City started selling out. So there's fans, but not as ruthless as Europe. Because again, there's promotion relegation over there in England and everywhere else. So that puts a lot more pressure on everyone than in America when there's not, 
promotion and relegation. We have the playoffs, which is great because it comes to the playoffs, everything is heating up. But it's not as, you know, crazy in the media or anything like that, you know, losing the game or, you know, missing a goal than it will be in England when those things happen. And your current team, Kai, is it Minnesota you're at at the moment? Uh, right now I'm a free agent. You're a free agent. I was a- yeah, I was in Minnesota, which okay. also was one of those where it was great experience that I wanted to do. It's a three months um, thing. I knew I was end of my contract this year, and I wanted a different scene, so I went to Minnesota to play for Adrian Heath, who was wow. also in England for many years. Yeah, and I just wanted to play for the guy because he's, you know, I've heard so much about him. So I said yes to that move for for three months. And so what have, what is on the horizon for Kai Kamara's football career on the pitch still? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm 36 years old. I mean, people will be looking at anyone else who think that's, that's it, they're done. But even when I started this whole journey, I knew I wanted to play till I was 40. And, you know, I feel great. I've played, you know, I play 90-minute games all the time. And, again, my injury's been one my whole career. And, you know, I'm looking to play. I'm, I'm playing some more, obviously. We're, me and my family in Sierra Leone now doing more of, work with our foundation hardship hands foundation but uh you know probably probably you know i would say go back to mls instead of doing more travel with three kids and wife but you know i am uh i am i'm still playing i'm still playing and i'll play until yeah until i'm 40. Hi, given you've already interviewed david beckham surely perhaps you could play for his inter- are you, Miami are you, side. it would make are you sense jealous? are you <laughs> jealous that i interviewed david beckham Maybe, you know, I think, I think me and Dan both are. Definitely. <laughs> Most people probably are, to be fair. <laughs> but, but just to summarise, obviously, you've made clear your feelings for Norwich and it's so good to hear. But what does Norwich mean to you if you had to sum it up? I'm a canary. You know, I'm a canary. Yeah. That's, that's really <laughs> what it is. Um, it's so special to see people in my feed randomly, you know, with the with the flags, you know, with the, with the green and yellow heart and just sending love to me. It's so special for that little, little time I was at Norwich to have that. And even for uh, one of the biggest trophies that I've won in my career is building a school in Sierra Leone. And I remember we premiered my movie in Norwich and most of that proceed, or all that proceed, I should say, went towards that school. So that's also a connection that I have with Norwich to say they were all they also played a part in building, you know, a school in Sierra Leone. So I'll be back. <laughs> yeah, we cannot wait to have you back. When travel is allowed, please come back and, and come and see everyone at Norwich. It would be an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us on All in Yellow Kai. It has been amazing listening to you and hearing all your stories and hearing Thank you reflect you on what Norwich meant <laughs> Thank to you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thanks to both of you. And uh, from Sierra Leone, we say hello, we say kushe, and bye, we just say bye. But um, thanks for having me. <laughs> well, I can nail that one, Kai. <laughs> kushe and bye. <laughs> Thank you ever so much, Kai. You are the best guy. Uh, I will nail that. Bye. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> bye. Thank you. <laughs> bye.